That's right. We're the old, I'm 40, you're 35. Yeah, we're the old guys now. Yeah. Yeah, we're set. Okay. Wow, okay. Quindi a 17.40 dobbiamo essere fuori di qua. Ok. You're on that side. Wow. Buonasera, cominciamo subito perché siamo, abbiamo qualche minuto di ritardo, benvenuti tutti, grazie a Darpeville per essere qui, grazie ad Arianne e a Chris eh, per avermi invitato a moderare questa sessione. Io sono Guido Romeo, sono capo servizio a Wired e naturalmente abbiamo eh, parlato di, eh, di Harper eh, diverse volte, l'ultima volta nella storia copertina sulle elezioni, è un personaggio eh, diciamo, della nostra epoca, del, del nostro momento e che eh, è assolutamente interessante avere in questo contesto al festival del giornalismo. Ormai tutti voi sapete che cosa ha fatto, è stato CTO della campagna di Obama e eh, anche il eh, ragazzo più figo in circolazione. Eh, questo è stato dimostrato scientificamente qui a Pierugia dal numero di foto che ha avuto negli ultimi, nelle ultime 48 ore. Eh, che cosa non è Harper? Eh, sicuramente non è modesto. You I didn't feel, get that one. I feel like I should be listening. <laughs> Abbiamo avuto fonti di intelligence che ci hanno detto che era un repubblicano che leggeva la Bibbia, ma non le abbiamo considerate. È un ragazzo del Colorado, in realtà, che ha 35 anni, che legge moltissimo e sviluppa open software e ha, diciamo, avuto un ruolo fondamentale nel usare i dati dei cittadini americani, sui cittadini americani, per capire chi sono e come differenziare la campagna di Obama. Perché questa cosa è interessante per noi? Harper non è un giornalista, però ha molto da dire ai giornalisti. E credo che a questo interrogativo abbiamo già risposto stamattina a Emily Bell, quando proprio qui ha spiegato che siamo in un momento di integrazione, stiamo cambiando i nostri, i nostri grandi media mainstream, stanno cambiando, si devono integrare col digitale, devono lanciare dei ponti, ma devono capire verso dove stanno lanciando dei ponti, perché bisogna cambiare, ma avere un'idea di dove si va. Harper è riuscito, con l'analisi dei big data, con i media elettronici, con molto intuito, a capire gli elettori, a scovare nuovi elettori, a, a fare fundraising, che è una, a raccogliere fondi per la campagna di Obama, che è, la chiave, è un fattore di successo uh, irrinunciabile oltreoceano. Quindi avete già capito, per noi giornalisti, per chiunque uh, è nel mondo di formazione, che deve andare verso i suoi elettori, dare un messaggio molto, uh, come dire, uh, molto uh, preciso e individuale a ciascuno dei suoi uh, lettori, a ciascuno dei suoi utenti, questo è una, uh, un valore enorme. Harper non sa tutte le cose cattive che ho detto di lui, perché si è messo solo le cuffie adesso, ma io gli lascio subito la parola per il suo intervento e dopo avremo spazio per uh, domande e una discussione con lui. Harper. Hello. I guess I'm already English. <laughs> And yeah, now the translators are talking to me. Okay. So, um, I'm going to put up some slides. And uh Hello. So I'm Harper, and this is the loudest thing I've ever talked into. First of all, thank you for having me. I'm very excited. I talk really fast. 
So if I talk too fast, just raise your hand all at once and I'll try and slow down. Let's try it real quick, everyone. Okay, good, 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 good. Sorry about that. Thank you for having me. This is really, really exciting. This is my first time in Italy. I'm very excited to be here. Um, obviously, based on all the questions that I've answered and all the pictures I've taken, you guys are excited to have me, so thank you very much. Um, I want to talk about a couple things today. Um, the first thing is who I am. The second one is I want to talk about two big innovations that we had on the campaign. And then the, the third one, um, stories about news and kind of some of the things that we learned. And then fourth, I want to talk about the, fut the future of news. So let's talk about my favorite thing to talk about, myself. Um, who, does anyone know who these guys are? Yeah, yeah, okay. So this is my first computer. This is uh, an Apple IIc. I got this at some point in the 80s before everyone here was born. Um, and uh, th has anyone read this book, Hackers? It's a very good book. It's a history book. Um, and it talks about hackers, and this is some of the stuff it talks about, sharing, openness, collaboration, and then the hands-on imperative, which I think just means, like, hands-on. Um, and I noticed for, after a while of reading this and kind of this book and kind of programming that I'm a hacker, um, but also I'm a coder. And I think that these two things can be used interchangeably oftentimes. I'm not a nefarious hacker, like I don't hack terrible things or whatever, but I'm a hacker. So after a while and, and programming a bunch, I joined this company called Threadless as the CTO. Does anyone here know Threadless? Okay, good. Does anyone own a Threadless t-shirt? Okay, we have a couple. You guys should buy more Threadless t-shirts. Um, but Threadless, we invented crowdsourcing, or so MIT told us. It's a very simple, simple, simple concept. The idea is we take this and we turn it into this. Very easy, right? There's four simple, simple steps. The first one is design. The second one is submission, where you guys submit things to us after you've designed them. Then a bunch of people score it, and then cash money falls from the sky. It's very easy. This is uh, what we do. And this is my, I like those uh, chains. So um, the idea here was we would build a great product that would do awesome things. And we did it. So I did the one thing that you all do once you've achieved what you want to achieve is I quit. So I went on a vision quest. Does anyone here know what a vision quest is? Okay, we have one person. I'm finding that this is a uniquely American thing, where you go into a desert and you find your spirit animal, usually through lots of narcotics. I didn't do any of that. Um, I instead went and, and helped at a venture capital firm in Chicago. But I really tried to discover what I was doing next. And these people discovered me. So this is Michael Slaby. Michael Slaby is this, was the CTO for 2008. Um, he is a very kind of political type person. Um, as you can see, he wears a suit. This is me. And um, there's a, a little bit of a difference between us. But um, the main thing here is that um, when we were hired, when I brought in, everyone was kind of like, hmm, I wonder why Harper? And so there's this idea, I was talking to my, my wife, and she said this idea, this Japanese idea of mochi wa mochi ya. Does anyone here speak Japanese? I don't, so I'm going to translate it. For rice cakes, go to the rice cake dealer. <laughs> um, well, stay with me here real quick. It'll, it'll... This is not where you applaud, that's later, that's later. There's an applause point, this is not it. So the reason this is, how do you put this into what I'm talking about is, for engineering, you hire engineers. Because oftentimes, and I think journalism is very much like this, you don't natively hire engineers. And so the campaign politics, you don't natively have engineers on your staff. And for us, this was very important. Um, we needed to hire lots and lots of engineers. Um, the reason was because we were starting from zero. Um, the US politics is very interesting where everyone starts from zero every time. And this time, we were very good because we had 18 months. So we had a very long time, um, a very long time to figure this out, especially compared to Romney and his camp, which had about three months. So we need to focus on one thing because we only had 18 months, which is execution. And by execution, we needed to make sure that no matter what we did, it worked. Oh, this was a... This was a cake that we had. Um, we got it at the last maybe two or three days before the election day, and no one would eat it. 
because we didn't want to, um, I guess, fuck it up. Um, so what did we do? We invested in a couple of things. The first thing we invested in is we built a platform. And this was really important. We built this platform called Narwhal. Has anyone here heard of Narwhal? Okay, good, good. Um, Narwhal was a concept. It was really important because Narwhal was an API. And the reason that we started with an API first, how many people here are tech people? Okay, we have a, a very few. So an API allows the various applications to interact with one another. Um, and the API for us was our foundation. It was really the thing that we were able to build upon. And the reason that this is so important is because it allowed us to have the freedom to do all of the important things and to focus on the products. And the products I'll walk you through real quick. So the first product and probably the most important product was the call tool. Um, this was one of my favorite products because it was used so much at the end. And what it allowed people to do is to log on to a website and to instantly make calls to various constituents and voters out in the field. And you didn't know these people. It randomly picked people for you. And so we did millions of calls on the last day. Um, this is really important for getting people out to vote. Very exciting. The next one was Dashboard. Dashboard was our online field office. So in grassroots fundraising, it's, I mean grassroots organizing, it's really important to have these field offices that you can go into and get a list of people to go knock on their doors and you walk around and you just, you basically tell people, hey, you should come vote. Um, for instance, my brother in Colorado had three people knock on his door on election day reminding him to vote. We did this across the nation. The mobile apps were very exciting. We had a mobile app, you could pull it up and you could find people that you needed to knock on their door and have conversations with them. We then pulled that data back in. This was exciting stuff. And then my favorite one was the contribution app because it was amazingly fast and very, very good and we raised a couple hundred million dollars, maybe three or four hundred million dollars. Then obviously all the social stuff which we'll get into a little bit later. We had about 200 deployed products that we, we deployed every week. This is crazy. Aaron over there probably thinks that's crazy. Um, we had thousands and thousands of servers. Um, failure was explicitly not an option. We had to win. Um, so we invested in two or three things. The one was user experience, making sure that our users really had a good handle on what we were building and why we were building it. We tested a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. It's so important to just underscore this thousands of times. We tested everything more than probably was appropriate. We did this thing called game day, where we basically broke everything and then built it back up just to make sure that it would work. And so on election day, because we had one time that this would maintain and this would work, there's a really great book on Amazon about this by a guy named Dylan Richard, which is my, uh, was on my team. Um, so we basically practiced failure for one month. But if you look at the campaign, we practiced failure constantly from day one to 18 months later. I don't know how many days that is. <laughs> um, so on election day, this was very exciting. So this is actually a, uh, a post-it note that was on a wall, and uh, it kind of gave the idea of election day and how important it was. Um, but we could not change anything any longer, no more changes. Um, so it was pretty chilled out, um, and thankfully we won. This is where you applaud. Okay. So there were two big innovations um, here. The first one was the team, and the second one was data. The first one, team, we needed about 30 engineers and we need to hire them in three months, which for anyone who here who has hired engineers is, is pretty much impossible. But it was very simple for us for one reason. We had this guy. And so whenever I talked to an engineer, I would say, hey, how would you like to talk, how would you like to come and work for the president? And they would all say yes or they would say wrong team. And if they were Republicans, they obviously said no. Right. So we we're focused on hiring the best, people who had been in, in this kind of role for years, 10 years. Um, we hired them from these really great companies. Um, you may really focus on the last one, that's Green. That's a really important company. Um, we hired, <laughs> let's go back and look at that again. Um, <laughs> we hired uh, 10 times the technical staff in 2012 than we had in 2008. So that's, that's, I think we had in total about 120 to 140 technical staff. I had personally 40 engineers. Um, there were 40 people on my team. This is my team. 
Um, we, this allowed us a couple things. One, to move very quickly. We knew that we were going to make mistakes. We knew that we wouldn't be successful always. So we needed to make sure that we could run as fast as we possibly could. So that's why it was important to hire the best. The second thing is we hired all these people from Google, from Quora, from Twitter, from Facebook. And the reason was because we wanted to learn what they learned. We wanted to stand on the shoulders of these giants. The next innovation that I'll talk about is data. Um, how many here have heard about big data this week? I think it should be everyone because every panel I was in was all about big data. Um, we sent tons of emails. Did anyone here get an email from the campaign? Okay, good, good. I don't know if that was legal. Um, so who here knows Dan Sinker? Did anyone see Dan Sinker this week? Okay, I won't tell him that no one raised their hands. Um, Dan Sinker sent this tweet in 2008, which says uh, that we, a lot of emails were sent. Um, this is an example email. If you notice, this is a nice little order. 56. This is targeting an action. So they looked at all of my fundraising profile and they said, hey, you are liable to give $56. That's a pretty random number. And of course, I just clicked that link and gave $56, so I didn't really help with the reinforcement. Um, we then added a Facebook login, so you could log into Facebook. Um, and then we sent this type of email. Now, the important thing here is it's very personalized. John Ruth, right there in the middle, that's my best friend from high school. And I know he lives in North Carolina, so they basically said to me, Harper, why don't you tell John to vote? So this is how we got more people to, out to vote. This is all through email. We did a lot with SMS. So we did this SMS thing, which was a very simple SMS app, where you would, um, you would log in and you'd submit your phone number and you'd opt in. And then what we would do is we would send you a text message that said, how would you like to give $5? And you'd say, I'd like to give $5, and you'd give $5. Very simple. When I first heard about this, I was sure this was going to be how it was going to go, which was totally not great. Um, I mean, right? So it worked so well, though, that we decided to do this on New Year's Eve. Um, it was really great, and it worked perfectly fine. Um, I thought it was a little rude, because I thought it was going to be like this. Um, <laughs> I mean, we've all been there, right? Like, late night texting, it's terrible. Um, but it worked incredibly well, and as you noticed, the numbers were very specific to how much you'd given before, using targeting, building into this, all this big data stuff, building into our voter contact and our, our fundraising. On voter contact, um, we did a lot to make sure that, that our volunteers, this is one of our volunteers, knocking on a door, that these volunteers um, knocked on doors that really made sense. Um, one of the things that is, that is I mean, do, do, do political campaigns knock on doors here? No? Okay, well, let's, let's walk through, let's role play for a second. Imagine you're a volunteer, and I give you a list of people, and I say, you have to go knock on their door, and you have to talk to them. And it's a huge list of like 100 people. And you just go out, and you just knock on all these doors. Well, you can imagine that if you get someone that opposes you or has an opposing belief, that this could be very frustrating or very scary or, 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 or uh, a lot of confrontation. Um, and I personally have so much apprehension about this experience that I would never do it, although I probably would, but I still am very scared. And so what we did is we tried to use math and big data to make sure that when you went and knocked on that person's door, that that person wouldn't just slam the door in your face. Of course they did still, but the idea was a Democrat, we didn't want to waste our volunteers by sending them to Republicans. What we wanted to do is send them to the people that mattered, the undecided voter, the people who would listen. And so using modeling and using big data to try and define who that person is. And then we did the same thing with phones, where we wanted to make sure that all of these people would listen that when we called so that we didn't waste our time and more importantly, we didn't waste the people we were calling's time because they would really react poorly to that. All this stuff was great. It raised a boatload of dollars. Boatload is a technical term. Um, it was a, a lot of a better content distribution method, and it was much more efficient um, for voter contact. So those are the two uh, innovations. Let's talk about news for a second. Um, I have four stories for you, and these are, I don't think anyone's ever heard these before, so I hope I don't get in trouble. Um, the first one is Twitter. Twitter forces transparency. This is something we learned aggressively. The idea here is that if you don't tweet, someone will tweet for you. And what ends up happening is you don't control that message. So let's look at some examples. Um, here's us not really doing great. 
Um, here's another one where I thought this was hilarious. I don't even know what this story is about, but I thought the headline was so funny. Um, but the thing is, is that that's what happens if you just let it go. But instead, we didn't just let it go. We engaged it. We really jumped in. And here's a great example of one of the programs we did where we sent DMs to hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and we, my favorite one is this one that says, which one is it? Um, feeling special because I got a DM from Joe Biden. He's kind of like America's drunken uncle. <laughs> um, maybe. Um, and then obviously, the, the important thing here is to look at, these people aren't like fancy celebrities on Twitter. These are normal people. And we sent these DMs to normal people because we knew they would be influential inside of their group, not inside of the whole internet. And so how do you use big data to really target those things? You have to trust Twitter. You need to just jump in and let it go. Now, we'll talk a little bit, a little bit later about how that goes wrong. Um, next story. This one's more fun. Um, Press people on campaigns really plan very far in advance. It's a very much of a long game. Um, how many reporters in the room? <laughs> okay, good. Um, we had lots of interview requests for the tech team. Just a lot. And every single one we said this, no. No interviews. And until the end, but one time they were like, Harper, at some point we are going to do an interview with the team. And... Uh, we're going to do it because this will really make the Republicans sad when they, read, when they read how awesome the tech team at Obama for America is. So this guy, this is Will St. Clair, and I want you all to follow Will St. Clair. So this is, this is Will St. Clair's Twitter account. Um, and this article came out on December 14th, 2011, which was very early in the campaign. Um, and basically, it just went through and talked about how incredible every engineer we had was, how they were the best engineers in the world. Um, and this made the Republicans very sad. And I talked to one of the Republicans after the campaign, and he said, when all these articles started coming out, we started to lose hope that we would ever win. This is just the tech press. It was amazing. The third one is awareness. So we have a soft launch. We had a product we built called Dashboard. And Dashboard was really awesome. It was a great product, but we wanted to make sure that nobody went to it the first day because we weren't quite ready. But, um, so we wanted to keep it quiet. But it was a big launch and a lot of reporters wanted to talk about it. So I have a question for you. If you want to keep it quiet, what newspaper do you launch it in? In the US, this has to be a national newspaper. So think of the big ones. And I'll give you a little bit. The Wall Street Journal. Now, that doesn't make any sense to me. I was like, what do you mean, the Wall Street Journal? But it's very, very simple. Um, it has old people that read it. It has a paywall, and it's conservative. And so, really, nobody cared. They read it, and they were like, ah, whatever. The crazy Obama people are doing something. And then no one went to it, which meant that we didn't have any problems. It worked out very well, and it was a very soft launch. For research. So, Narwhal. Um, you guys all know about Narwhal. This is Jim Messina photoshopped as a Narwhal. Jim Messina was the campaign director, or the campaign manager. Um, we have a lot of these photoshopped pictures. No pictures, Aaron. Um, <laughs> no pictures, every person in the room. Um, but the idea here was that nobody understands Narwhal. And the, the reason was, is because I don't think really reporters understand tech. And they don't take time to really think about tech. Um, so there is this article written by Sasha Eisenberg. It was a really good article, except it was all wrong. Um, it talked about Narwhal as being this key database that was going to do all this stuff. But actually, um, it was 100% wrong. And more importantly, every single interview I had um, through the campaign or after the campaign referenced this article and talked about it. So this trick is, is that Narwhal had nothing to do with data. Um, so reporters, journalists, don't be lazy. Do work and really look at what we're talking about, because oftentimes we're saying things. We're not trying to be tricky. But just looking at someone previously is pretty bad. OK, good. Thanks, Ariana. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the future of news. But sadly, I don't know anything about the future of news, so I want to talk about what's happening right now. Um, this is the new news. Does anyone know these guys? Right? Um, this is where I go to for news. This is where I went to to read about what we were doing on the campaign. This is where I went to to read about Romney. This is where I go every day to read news. Do you remember this? 
this wasn't very good. Reddit got in a lot of trouble for doing a lot of witch hunts and all that stuff, trying to find people. Um, this one was fun. Um, that was not good. So obviously there's a lot of holes here. Um, we need to help it. It's really important that we all help these groups raise up. Because we're, I would say there's a lot of young people in the room, yes? Yes? Um, that's probably, how many of you go to those places for news? Let's go back to that list. Okay. That's the most hands I've seen all day. How many go to newspapers? Okay, so you guys are all old. We've just separated the old from the young. <laughs> um, the important thing is that we need to do this. So all the people that raise their hands, we are the ones that are going to help these organizations be better. The next one is math. Math is for some reason very hard. Who knows this guy? Nate Silver? 538, very exciting, very important um, person in the campaign newsroom. Um, this is what I said when someone said, what advice do you have for journalists? Um, it's really important that we bring math into reporting. Um, this is Revenge of the Nerds. You can barely read that, but it just says, bring math into your reporting. Um, there's a lot of nerds out there that would love to help, that would love to sit and talk to you about what you're reporting, that would love to build a model to kind of help you with what you're doing. Um, this is really important, but it has to start with you guys here. How many here want to be journalists when they grow up? Okay, how many want to be journalists and they are grown up? Okay. Well, that's all I got for slides. Um, I'm, I'd love to ask, answer some questions and uh, then we can get started. Okay, ci sono dei microfoni in giro per la sala, quindi vi basta che alziate una mano e vi avvicineranno. Eh, io intanto beh, ho tante domande anch'io, devo dire, per Harper, mentre eh, la prima domanda è sempre quella più difficile perché si rompe il ghiaccio. Ma intanto ti chiedo una cosa, è vero che non eri sicuro di accettare, non hai accettato subito la proposta di Obama. I can't hear anything through these. Was, is it true that you, you didn't accept straight away the offer to join Obama's campaign, but you actually had to think it over? Yes. Um, it, it's really scary. Um, I, didn't really, I didn't really think about what it meant. And then I was, uh, I was at my parents' house, and I was just kind of sitting, and it's in Colorado. It's very beautiful. And I'm just sitting there, and I was just like, uh-oh. <laughs> this is a really big deal. Um, and I knew I could do it, but there are aspects of it that I was worried about, the, the uh, politics, the um, just making sure, because we could not make a mistake. So we had to make sure that we succeeded. And so that was, uh, it was very stressful. Um, but um, I talked to my wife, who's over here. I talked to my father, and my father was like, what's wrong with you? Of course you have to do this, because it's history. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, history, that's not, like, that, that's not a lot of pressure. Um, <laughs> and, um, but, you know, luckily it turned out fine. I think this would be very different if we would have lost. I would have been like, thanks, Dad. Um, but now I am very much like, thanks, Dad. So it was good. It was good. It was good that you joined, yeah. yeah. Maybe. C'è una domanda lì. Ne raccogliamo, allora, ne raccogliamo due o tre di domande. Um, first of all, funziona? Quiet? Very, very quiet. Oh, okay. Okay. Harper, yeah. Good. first of all, thanks a lot for all you did. And I watched the campaign from here. I live in a CZ, grew up in Milwaukee, so not far from Chicago. Um, I really appreciate all you did for the campaign, and I just wondered if your ties to the Obama administration are ending now. Are you involved at all in trying to change attitudes on affordable health care, getting rid of the awful DOMA? And are you doing anything now? Or no, no. No, you can't. I mean, 
the campaign and the White House are very separate, aggressively separate. Um, there's laws about the separateness. Um, and so, m obviously, I know a lot of powerful people through this experience, but um, they still think I'm the weird nerd kid in the corner. So it's, I don't think they have a lot of power. Now, with that said, um, I do feel that I have opportunities as an activist. And so, you know, if there's something that I truly think is important, I would definitely stand up and try and make things happen. Um, so, um, but hopefully they'll listen to me then. Hello. Uh, first of all, congratulations for your achievement for winning of uh, the election. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask you, uh, you that know Obama personally, you that meet him, uh, how much do you think uh, his personality, his great charisma helped in winning uh, the, uh, the election? I mean, uh, of course communication is important, but uh, you have to communicate something. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So I met the president three times, I think, in very small, small, short meetings. Um, and every time I was reminded that he seems like a normal person. Like you talk to him and he just seems like someone who is very normal. It's very exciting to have that. He doesn't seem so distant. He seems very approachable. And every time I talked to him, he, he made fun of my beard. Um, so he's like, you know, he's just, he's a normal person because everyone else makes fun of my beard too. Um, but um, I do think that, I don't know about the charisma, if that bleeds out. I mean, it does obviously because he's a very charismatic speaker. What I think is more important though is um, him, his values, are built into who he hires and built into who helps push out his message. And so the way we built our software was related to his values. The way we did our organizing, our grassroots organizing, was related to his values. The people we hired as volunteers were related to what he valued. And so it really came from the top. And so the communication part was very important, but it was even more important that he set those values and then that we fulfilled them. Hi, Arper. Thanks for being here, first of all. And uh, I'd like to know if you're campaigning anyhow for uh, the CISPA or C SOPA in this moment. We know there's um, yes. at the Congress uh, stuff is going on. Well, um, the U.S. Congress doesn't seem to be able to do anything. Um, so I have a little bit of hope that they'll somehow screw it up um, and it won't get to the White House. Um, but with that said, being very... Uh, I'm really against those things. I think that they'll ruin the internet and ruin some of the freedoms that we enjoy on the internet. Um, the internet is, is, should be about equal access and kind of, um, I think those things will ruin what we have. Um, but uh, I sadly don't have much more information than that. There's a question here. I'll, I need to ask you a question on your presentation. Um, you, in your presentation you showed the um, the blunder from Reddit on the Boston Marathon, and that's, that, there was a lot of discussion on the web about that because about, it was a crowdsourcing effort, and that the wisdom of the crowd proved very wrong in that case. So, uh, I, what? I actually disagree. I think the wisdom of the crowd continued. I think that the journalists who reported the wisdom of the crowd as truth without actually double checking it themselves was the problem. Because I think what happened is everyone looked at what Reddit was saying and said, oh, they've found the bombers. So let's post those pictures up everywhere. And there was, I mean, Drudge Report linked directly to the imager link mm -hmm. that Reddit had, that 4chan had created saying, these are the people that look suspicious. Okay. And Drudge Report, although is seemingly terrible, also gets a lot of traffic. But would you say that we, especially reporters, sometimes misunderstand that what the crowdsourcing, I mean, crowdsourced, crowd is good for doing some things and not I, for others. I think reporters are lazy. Okay. I mean, I think full stop. I think there are a bunch of good reporters who m many are in this room, but I think a lot of them say, I, because we are in a world of hits. We need hits. I'll just throw out. We just need hits on our page. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to link to the easiest and closest thing, and then I'm going to be done because I just close that window and it's posted. And then it's, it's, it's not in, like it's, it's, it's kind of ruined. Now you have people who are writing actual information, and there were great posts that use that information, distilled it, but that wasn't as exciting as the Drudge Report huge link, you know, like bombers, internet superheroes, like all this other crap. Um, 
And I think that was the problem, and I think that's why I wanted to push on that we are the ones that needed to, need to work to make this better. We have other questions around here. Please. Yeah. Okay, I'm Paola Faraka from Radiofonica.com. You know, everyone makes mistakes. Which one do you think you and your team have done in this campaign? Mm -hmm. This is a good question. Um, we made a lot of mistakes. Um, so I, but I think the one of, we didn't listen as much at first. I think that was a big one where we came in and we thought we were, we knew what we were doing and we didn't listen as much as we should have. And so um, I learned a lot from this just about how to listen and how to work inside of organizations that don't necessarily trust tech. A lot of times uh, organizations don't trust technology because technology has not been worth trusting and the campaign is like that. And so we came in and we thought, oh, they don't trust tech because they don't know technology, so we're gonna fix that. That's never a good attitude. Um, and so we had to um, learn a lot to get through that. Um, other than that, everything was perfect. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I know you've been doing a lot of homework on Italian politics and uh, on the Italian electoral system. And uh, since we had elections not very long ago here, and uh, it was, uh, well, the outcome was uh, quite surprising, as we all saw and heard uh, uh, in the last, uh, in the last uh, months. And we're still trying to come to terms with it. Yeah. Um, how much do you think your way of uh, looking at the big data and uh, elections, how much can you export it to Italy? Does it make any sense? And uh, of course, people have been talking about doing it here, but uh, well, is this really doable? W would you come and be an engineer for some campaign here? <laughs> um, probably not. Um, <laughs> I think the first thing to really, to really, it's important to understand is that the U.S. Uh, election system is aggressively different than any other election campaign system in, in the world. Um, how we do campaign finance, how we raise money for our own campaigns, how we do voter, I mean, grassroots is huge. Even on the people, even the people who don't do grassroots end up doing grassroots. Um, all of these things are very they're just kind of status quo and um, I just recently gave a talk in Germany where I realized that everything that we did would be illegal um, which was shocking and so I think it's you know I don't know the the data laws here in in Italy but I'm sure they're very similar to the rest of the EU which is aggressively against the type of things that we did um, so I think that there's a lot of it doesn't apply one for one now there's of course learnings that I think are really important um, one of the things is that the grassroots is very important and I think we saw that a little bit with the online grassroots that was done with the Five Stars movement and you know some of that and I think and I'm just learning about this so if I'm wrong please someone I feel like this is a pop quiz um, but um, that seems to be something that is that is that can happen here and does happen here so I wonder what is the next step and I actually think that this is an evolution that we have to keep going through I mean we did the same thing in the US with 2004 with Dean Mm -hmm. where the Dean campaign invented a lot of really amazing ways to do organizing online, and then he lost. Um, you know, he was not successful, but he used that technology to r bring all of the Democrats up. And he really set the stage for Barack Obama to succeed in 2008 with technology. Um, and then in 2008, that set the stage for us to succeed in 2012. And, you know, four years is a long time. I don't know what's going to happen in 2016 in the U.S., but... You know, I think that you guys are in an interesting situation where you have a platform that obviously works. So what is the next, you know, who is going to use this next? Who's going to build on top of this next? And who's going to build on it that is more ubiquitous so that you, so you don't have such a disruption? Is this technology cheap? I mean, uh, you always get this thing that, uh, oh, let's do new media so it's, it'll be cheaper and we have uh, much more impact. It is. But, uh, Given the figures and what you showed, it doesn't look cheap at all. So it is not cheap at all. Um, I think te technology was, m I don't even know um, how much it is. And if I make a guess, I'll probably regret making that guess. But let's just say that it is, it is um, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars that we invested in technology. Um, so if you, th you have to think of it going backwards a little bit. So after the campaign ended, after we won, a lot of news was out there that said that we raised a billion dollars. So if you have a billion dollar company, how big is the technology department for a billion dollars? How much money are you spending on technology for a billion dollars? How much money do campaigns raise in Italy? 
Uh, it's it's uh, state money, so, okay, so you it's can, not declared. The, so you the can, private money is not declared. Basically. Private money is not declared. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Um, <clears throat> so you guys can hire all the engineers you want. Just find some rich person that believes in you. I guess you found that and it didn't work uh, out. We've done it? that, yeah, 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 but it doesn't work very well. Yeah. So, uh, How many engineers did he have? Uh, it's not declared. The figure is not declared. <laughs> but he so did that seems like a good place to start. Yeah. Transparency for one is, <laughs> is one thing. Um, that actually really helped us because what that meant was um, there were no secrets about that stuff. Mm -hmm. So both we could see what Romney was doing but also we had to be very transparent about what we were doing um, which meant we had to be very careful which meant we had to follow a lot of rules and there was a lot of constraint that helped us be successful. It really helped us. Um, so that's, I mean, um, it is very, very, very expensive. Okay. I'll t we'll take it out. There's a question there. this on? Yeah. Um, it seems the way you discuss like the technocratic part of the Obama campaign Speak is very, up. it seems like the way that you discuss the technocratic part of the Obama campaign is, uh, implies a huge amount of power for this kind of like technological organizing. And the same thing when you say that when you read the news, you read 4chan and Twitter and Anonymous. I wonder if you, I mean, could you have done the same thing for the Romney campaign? Uh, do you have any thought about the ethical implications of this kind of crowdsourced, yeah. technological, grassroots stuff? So you can't, I, I mentioned before how the technology came from the president. And you cannot um, take the same technology and just apply it to any candidate. Um, a good example of this is the president uh, hired two guys, Jeremy Byrd and, and Mitch Stewart, to run our organizing, our, our, on, our physical grassroots organizing campaign. Um, and those guys then, kind of decided how they, um, how they were going to do it, which meant they were going to do it team-based, which means it's neighborhood-based. So they had every single neighborhood in the U.S. had a team that was the Barack Obama team that then would go and work inside of that neighborhood. And it was really powerful because you would log on to Dashboard or you would go to your field office and you would see your neighbors and your friends that were in your neighborhood. Um, and that's how, that's how granular we got is every neighborhood. Now, if you look at what the Romney was doing, he didn't believe that that was important. And so the candidate truly didn't believe that that was important and he would not invest his campaign into trying to represent that same thing that we did physically. So the software didn't matter. We could place the software on top of Ramney's campaign, but he couldn't use it because he doesn't have the infrastructure or, more importantly, the beliefs to support it. And that goes through and through where you can just, this is, a, I joke a lot that I think that in 2016 they're just going to hire people that look like homeless people. If you look at, you know, Michael Slavey, Harper, and then the homeless person is next, right? Um, <laughs> And I, I think that that is like, I, I think that's the worry is a lot of people put, they place, okay, Harper, lives a, he, listens, he reads Reddit and he reads Twitter and he, he gets his news from, you know, Anonymous and he gets his news from 4chan and Reddit and all this stuff. And, and then they're going to think, okay, we need to hire a, a, a 4chan person. That is the biggest mistake ever, right? You don't want to do that. I think what it is, what more importantly is we need to be aware that a lot of people are doing this. And we need to be aware that you need to hire someone that is actually going to execute and do the work. You can't just say, hire the caricature. And I think that's what a lot of the media is saying, is like the Republicans are like, well, we need to hire people with beards. That's not true. Like, it's probably the worst idea ever. Um, but it's, you know, it's something that happens a lot in this. And so I, it's, an easy, it's an easy problem, um, and I, I do worry about it. One question down there. <coughs> Um, hi, Harper. I would like to ask some questions, um, some tips about the, um, uh, like the teamwork, for, uh, especially at the phase of the starter, uh, like the starting phase of the project. Like, um, like when I'm doing a, a new project, I always find myself in a bunch of mess that, you know, team with someone do the job, someone don't do the, like, um, someone have a lot of ideas, and then we finally ended up on the, um, like, finding the data, finding the right information, and then, uh, ignoring the final product, so I would like to some tips. I don't have a lot of good tips because um, what we had was the fate of the free world um, that really pushed us, and uh, I know that's a pretty American-centric um, identi identity, but sadly, it worked. Um, so the team thought, if we screw this up, then um, we will lose the election, and then we'll probably all have to go to camps or something. Um, and so what we did is we just made sure that we always were thinking about that, the, the, the end. 
Um, and so I actually learned some things from this because I do a lot of civic, civic data stuff, working with cities and stuff, and oftentimes those jobs are terrible. No one wants to do them. And so you put these great engineers into these positions and they, f they, f they f fail because it seems um, endless. And so what we did on the campaign is we made it, we shrunk it. So we said, you have this little bit of time to solve this problem. We gave a deadline and then suddenly it, it's achievable and you can get to that point. And if you don't, if you, and the, the, you know, the election, you can't move. And so if we didn't get to that point, we just kind of, we all died or something. I don't know what happened. Um, but we were very, very concerned about it. So I don't have a good answer for you um, other than really, really bite off smaller pieces and don't think so big. The other thing we did is we aggressively hired people who were interested in shipping and doing the work, and then we fired the people who didn't. Um, and I think that there's a lot of opportunities that you have where you, where you, you could get rid of someone, but you end up uh, keeping them on your team for too long. And so um, cut the fat. I suppose. Okay, Harper, uh, I get news that it's raining outside and we passed our time, so I have, we have to cut it here. But this has been really great. Thank you for being with us. Thank all of you. Grazie Thank a tutti you. Grazie a tutti.